The message today is entitled, Loving God Deeply Heals a Marriage Completely. Loving God Deeply Heals a Marriage Completely. And I want to share this song I wrote uh, years ago, and it talks about my love for God. Actually, I wrote it uh, as a song between Adam and Eve. And you remember Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden? their marriage was put to the test. You understand? And even though the words are sung between Adam and Eve, the message of the song is between our hearts and the heart of God. So listen to the message in the song. I hope you're blessed. my quiet place I still see your face and I hear your voice down in my soul Lord I make this vow and I pray somehow but you will believe me when I say that I'm forever yours, forever yours. I give my life completely, you're mine, and I am.
Fill my life with your Holy Spirit's presence and power. Speak to me, through me, and for me. I promise you, Lord, I'll always give you the honor, the glory, and the praise. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. And let the church say. I said, let the church say. My message this morning, loving God deeply heals a marriage completely. The Bible tells us that Jacob, after many days of hard travel, had finally reached the valley region of Haran. He sat down to rest near a well when he saw in the distance coming towards him the most glorious face he had ever seen. Her skin was tanned and glowing. Her features kind and loving. Her long black hair fell over her shoulders and she walked with the grace of a gazelle in springtime. Her smile was as radiant as a flower, and she seemed to be moving to an inaudible melody from an inspired symphony. Have mercy. Isn't that what being in love feels like? You're moving to an inaudible melody from an inspired symphony. As she made her way to the well, gathering about her were her father's adoring sheep. Jacob was transfixed. He could not keep his eyes off of this beautiful maiden. Her name was Rachel, the daughter of Laban. And I imagine in my mind's eye, as she approached the well, Jacob sprang gallantly to his feet. May I help you? Let, let me help you. I can see him now walking over to that heavy rock that lay over the mouth of the well. And even though that rock usually required several men to move it, that day, somebody help me today, that day, Jacob determined to impress this fair young maiden, took a hold of that rock by himself without breaking a sweat, the veins in his forehead barely visible, Jacob shoved that stone aside and with a smile waved his hand and invited Rachel to water her sheep. Rachel stood there, her smile demure and discreet. She stood there trying to hide her amazement at the strength and thoughtfulness of this stranger. All the while trying not to look too Overly impressed. You know how you ladies do. <laughs> Rachel invited him home to meet her father and Laban welcomed the young Jacob royally. Within a few minutes of meeting Rachel's family, Jacob felt that his search for a bride was over. He had finally met the one his heart had been longing for and praying for. I got to tell you, I know how Jacob felt that day. You see, many years ago, before I met my wife, Linda, I wrote a song while I was a teenager. I never recorded the song, but I, I remember the words. The words are, I will wait for you. 
Help me somebody. If you're the one God has for me, I'll wait for you. Though the road seems long in my heart, I'll sing a song and I'll wait for you. Yeah, you got it. You got it. Each night I pray for someone who will need me. And I wait for you. Though the road seems long in my heart, I'll sing a song and I'll wait for you. Uh, can I give you the, the, the rest of it? I will wait for you, my darling. I was a teenager, didn't know what I was singing about. I will wait for you, my darling. Your sweet touch, your warm embrace. I will wait for you, my darling, for the love time can't erase. Come on, help me somebody. <laughs> when I saw Linda's face like Jacob, I knew my waiting days were over. And that day Jacob knew his waiting days were over. And finally, Jacob felt like he was home. No longer a hunted recluse in the hills. No longer a fugitive on the run. He had met somebody with whom he wanted to, as they say, settle down. Well, as Jacob began working with Rachel's family in the fields, Rachel's father Laban soon saw what an indispensable asset to the family Jacob was. And so one day Jacob said, Laban said to Jacob, 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 you've been working here a while. What shall your wages be? Jacob could barely speak his answer to Laban. Sir, he said, I would be most grateful if you would place all of my earnings in an escrow account and let it go towards the dowry that I would like to give you one day. Oh my, said Laban, what are you saying, Jacob? Do you have your eyes on one of my daughters? The oldest one, Leah, perhaps. Oh, no, 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 no. He said, Jacob, no, 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 not the oldest one, no, no, it's Rachel, <clears throat> your youngest daughter whose smile has stolen my heart. Laban said, Jacob, now you said you're willing to work for her hand in marriage. How long are you willing to work for Rachel? Or, or let me rephrase that. How many years of hard labor do you think she's worth? Jacob, are you willing to work for her for seven years for her? Jacob said, Laban, for Rachel's hand, I would gladly work the next seven years of my life. And so the compact was made, the deal was done, and for the next seven years, Jacob worked for Laban. Oh, friends, you know, sometimes in the heat of love and passion, we'll, we'll say anything. <laughs> Honey, for you, I'll climb the highest mountain. I would cross the deepest sea, but don't ask me for a glass of water in the middle of the night. The passion wears off, the enthusiasm wanes. Yes, yes, sometimes, you know, those folks, they get up, but if you listen closely, you might hear them fussing just a little bit, you know? But not so with Jacob. When Laban said, seven years hard labor for Rachel, Jacob said, where do I sign? And so it was. That in the seventh year of labor, Jacob asked that the date of the wedding be set. Laban smiled, made haste to arrange the wedding feast. Now, according to the customs and culture and law of those times on the wedding day, the bride was heavily veiled. And so it was on Jacob's wedding night that one of the most tragic deceptions and one of the most wretched frauds of all time was committed against a young man in love. You see, what Jacob couldn't see behind the veil as he went into the tent that night to consummate his marriage on that first honeymoon night, what he couldn't see in the night, in the glare of the early morning light, Jacob began to see clearly as, can, 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 you, can, you, can you go over with me in the middle of that tent, in the middle of the morning, in the morning is, the sun is coming up and as, as Jacob kind of opens his eyes slowly, he stares into the face of his new bride and a cry, a, no, no, a scream of 
disbelief breaks forth from his lips, Jacob must have cried out what you would probably cry out. Lord have mercy. Jacob realized that the woman he had caressed during the night, the woman whose lips he had kissed, the woman whose breasts he had fondled under a moonlit sky, and I'm just reading Bible here. It was not Rachel, but her weak-eyed, some, uh, some interpreters say cross-eyed, sister Leah. Poor Jacob. The woman whose curves he had explored carefully. Talk to me, somebody. Whose embrace had thrilled him through the night was not Rachel, but her older, much older sister Leah. And right away, Jacob realized that karma had struck. What I mean, you see, he was the one who years before had tricked his father by wearing a hairy garment and defrauding his brother of his birthright. The trickster was on the receiving end now of a cruel hoax. He was now the victim of a treachery similar to the one he used against his own brother. Somebody said payback is a dog, isn't it? That night, Jacob had been hoodwinked, deceived by chicanery and subterfuge. He was now officially married to the wrong woman. Now, you see, Leah, as a woman, was not the one Jacob was attracted to. She was not the one he had dreamed about for seven years. Yeah, Leah was nice. She was intelligent. She was interesting. But when Jacob looked at Leah, he was neither charmed nor romantically inspired by her face. Laban, come here. What have you done? This is your doing. You got to make this right. What can I do, said Laban. My hands were tied by the customs culture Laws of my people, the older daughter must marry first. Oh, but have no fear. I have a backup plan, Jacob. You can have Rachel too, if you are willing to work another seven years. Ooh, and there in the verse, verse 20 of our scripture, we have one of the tenderest, most romantic declarations in all of scripture. The Bible says that Jacob served seven years more years for Rachel, but check this out. It seemed to him those seven years like a few days. Woo, that's love. Somebody said that's love. And there's nobody here in their right mind who would not love, love to be loved like that. Everybody in here, you know, everything in us longs to be loved like that. To be loved deeply, passionately is the hope of everybody. Young people, old people. Listen, let me tell you something. I know, I know a friend who his wife died. He's 93. He called me the other day to tell me he's in love. Now, now why was Rachel the one that Jacob was attracted to and not Leah? All I can say is that it is difficult, almost impossible, to explain the mystery of human attraction and romance. What makes one person attracted to another and brings them to the point where they are romantically linked for life will forever be a mystery. Often what makes one person appear attractive to another does not in the least turn on somebody else. <laughs> are you with me today? Now, friends, what is romance? Now, most words have multiple meanings, and such is the case with the word romance. Now, here are some definitions of the word romance. One definition of romance is a relationship of deep passion, intimacy, and tender emotions. Someone said romance is the fuel that keeps a relationship filled with feelings of excitement, 
mystery and meaning. Someone also said, romance is just an enjoyable love relationship, a warm fire that deepens the bond at any stage of a relationship. And if you were looking down from another planet, you would think that Hollywood invented romance. But I want you to know today, the Old Testament unabashedly makes it clear that romance is a flame of divine origin. Ah, did you hear me today? It is the flame that draws soul to soul, heart to heart, mind to mind, flesh to flesh. And it is a flame in the human breast that is sustained by mutual sharing, by trust and affection. In short, romance is a gift from God. And true romance is what the Bible calls first love. First love. You, you remember first love. You remember how you felt about that person when you first realized you were in love? How many of you remember what first love feels like? Say amen. I said say amen. If you remember what first love feels like, you know, the joy, the happiness, the bliss, the shared delight, the, the purity of heart and motive, you, you wanted to do all that was right. You know, it, it, you know, I want you to know it's the devil, it is the devil who has taken romance and corrupted it. How can I make this clear? Thank you, God. In a true Christian home, there will always be romantic words spoken. In a true Christian home, you will often hear words of affection and fondness. One of the saddest things in life is to visit a professed Christian home where it soon becomes clear to you that the romance has completely died and no longer exists in that home. And it's so sad when husbands and wives live together under the same roof, not as lovers and friends, but as tired roommates who can't wait for the morning to come. Because there is no romance in that relationship. In some homes, some couples don't even share the same bed or room. And friends, that's a prescription for trouble. You want to get your spouse in trouble, start sleeping away from them. I heard of a husband who asked his wife when she thought they could make a date to be romantic in bed, she said, well, maybe on your birthday. That is not a true Christian home. God says, say it again. That is not a true Christian home. As a matter of fact, 1 Corinthians 7, 5 says, do not deprive each other of sexual relations unless you both agree to refrain from sexual intimacy for a limited time so you can give yourself to fasting and prayer. And after you pray and fast, you better come back together, the Bible says, so that Satan doesn't tempt you because of your incontinency, which means your lack of self-control. So brothers and sisters, conjugal rights and conjugal delights, hey, did you hear me today? They are essential to making a Christian marriage happy, romantic, and fulfilling. Now, to be sure, romance cannot be compelled. It cannot be forced or staged. It ought to be joyous. Somebody say joyous. It ought to be voluntary. Somebody say voluntary. It ought to, it's not to be obligatory. Come on, you, you better come over here. No, that's not, that's not, romance don't work like that. Or else, or else what? Romance does not work like that. Romance in a Christian marriage serves two very important functions. First of all, I tell people, you know when the space shuttle used to go into space? The booster rockets, those powerful rockets that took it into orbit, they would always fall off. Often romantic emotion is the booster rocket 
that puts your ship of marriage into orbit. And too often, they fall off. Once you're in orbit, you got to make the best of the trip, however. God knew we would keep romantic emotions and we would need them. For if most of us knew what the trip would be like, we probably wouldn't go. Romantic emotion is the firepower that draws two people together and binds their hearts as one. Romance is not love. Did you hear me today? Romance is not love. But love without romance is cold. Love without romance is hollow. Romance is more than just sitting at dinner, expensive dinner, gazing into dark liquid eyes over a sumptuous meal highlighted by a gift of Roses and a bouquet of roses. Romance is more than just sitting there with a soft, supple hand in your hand under a moonlit sky. Romance is a fire. Help me, somebody. It is a fire of divine origin, and it has its place in all loving Christian marriages. Romance can provide a spark of renewal in a relationship that is facing the challenges and rigors of everyday life. How can I make this clear to you? Come see a man hot and sweaty, about to take out the garbage. I'm talking about myself. And the wife says to him, my wife says, oh, you're so happy. Handsome. You look so good. You know, I'm talking about myself. So I can tell you for a fact, when a man taking out the garbage hears that he looks good, he'll go all over the house looking for more garbage. Now the servant of the Lord reminds us, Married life is not all romance. It has its real difficulties, its homely details, and you won't always look like pinups and model dolls to each other. She also says that the wife must not consider herself a little fragile doll to be tended to. Ladies, she says a real woman is one who knows how to put her shoulders under real burdens. Not imaginary burdens. A real woman is one who knows that there are other things to be thought of than herself. Yes, married life is not all romance, but don't you lose that first love. Don't you lose the romance. There always ought to be romance in your marriage. And if you can't think of something romantic to say, go to the Bible. The Bible will give you something romantic to say. Uh, but I would advise you not to try to use it word for word. <laughs> Especially the King James Version. Don't, don't, the context doesn't always work. How can, how can I explain? Song of Solomon, the most probably romantic book in the Bible. But it doesn't always work. How can I explain? Here's what I mean. Chapter 4, verse 4. Can you imagine me trying to be romantic saying this to Linda? Behold, thou art fair, my love. Behold, thou art fair. Thou hast dove's eyes within thy flocks. Thy hair is as a flock of goats. <laughs> that appear from Mount Gilead. Thy teeth. That's, this is verse 2. If you want to, yeah, we have, thy teeth are like a flock of sheep and they are even shorn which came up from the washing whereof. Even everyone bear twins and none is barren among them. And verse 3. Thy lips are like a thread of scarlet and thy speeches. I'm coming, I'm coming down your street now. Thy temples are like a piece of pomegranate within thy locks. Linda, look at verse 4. Linda, thy neck is like the tower of David. <laughs> Built for an armory. <laughs> Whereon thou hang a thousand bucklers, all shields of mighty men. Uh, rephrase it. 
make it your own because it doesn't always work. But don't let life and its troubles strip your marriage of romance. It is actually Satan, Ellen White says, who works to alienate the affections between two people who love one another. Brothers and sisters, I want you to know God has the power to give back to your relationship the glow of romance and first love. And if your relationship needs a spark, there are some things you can do to rekindle those emotions. I'll never forget I was watching one of my favorite shows from back in the day, All in the Family. And in this particular episode, Mike and Gloria, they, their romance had kind of gotten cold and, and their relationship had kind of gotten cold and so they decided to go away to rekindle the fire of romance in their relationship. So they went away to the Poconos. And, but as they were trying to hold each other and hug each other, it was, they hadn't done it so long, it was kind of awkward and, and difficult. And finally she just broke down crying. And he said, what's the matter? What's the matter? She looked at him, she said, we used to be such animals. <laughs> and he, he said, but, 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 but we're, we're still animals. We're, we're just a little housebroken, that's all, he said. So if you two in your marriage have become housebroken, <laughs> here's what you can do to rekindle. First, remember, what the doctor tells you to do to get better when you get sick is a good idea for you to be doing that all along. Don't wait for the romance to begin dying to kindle it. Woo. What you ought to be doing to be healthy, don't wait for the doctor to tell you to do it when you get sick. Keep doing it. Go back and the Bible says, repent and remember and you'll recover your first love. Oh, hallelujah, somebody say amen. amen. Repent and remember and you will recover your first love. Go back and do what you used to do that got your relationship going in the first place. Continue the early attention. Study how to advance the happiness of each other. And wherever there is mutual love and mutual forbearance, marriage, instead of being the end of love, will be as it's supposed to be, the beginning of a beautiful, romantic love. And when you have that kind of love in the home and the warmth of true friendship and that binds heart to heart, that kind of love, Ellen White says, is a foretaste of the joys you will experience in heaven. Oh, thank you, Lord. Friends, the divine love emanating from Christ never destroys romance. Instead, the love of Jesus refines romance, purifies it, elevates it, ennobles it. Is there anybody listening to me today? Anybody here knows who, like me, I've often pondered and wondered, how come some of the greatest love songs and the titles of those songs sound like they should have been written to God and not to a human being. Have you ever thought about that? Now I know many of those love songs were written for relationships between men and women and some of their lyrics celebrate a physical love between a man and a woman, but have you, like me, always wondered why the best love songs aren't written to God? I even remember listening to the words of some of those love songs and feeling conflicted singing them because I felt like I should be singing this to God. Okay. How can I say this? Anybody know what I'm talking about? Okay, let me give you some examples. You are everything. And everything. You're sitting there like you don't know what I'm talking about. You are everything and everything is you. Beautiful song, but that's how I feel about God. Do you understand what I'm saying? 
Oh, okay, let me see if I can come down your street. You make me feel brand new. Or, or how about Whitney's, I will always love you. That's how I feel about God. Okay, can I come down some more? You have the best of my love. My endless love. You're the best thing that ever happened. Oh, you know that one, huh? You are the sunshine of my life. You are the wind. Come on, beneath my wings. You're the meaning in my life. You're the inspiration. Beautiful song, but that's how I feel about God. You're everything I hoped for. You're everything I need. You are so beautiful to me. And everything I do, I do it for. Come on now. That's how I feel about my God. You take my breath away. Have I told you lately? Somebody help me today. Have I told you lately? that I love you. How am I supposed to live without you? Or oh, the greatest love of all. Oh, I'm going to run to you because you love me. Yeah, I know those songs were written for relationships between men and women. Beautiful songs, but that's how I feel about my God. Loving God is my greatest romance. Because those songs did not express fully how I feel about my love for God and how I feel about the passion and intimacy and tender emotions and the first love I feel for God. Fifty years ago, I decided, you know what? I'm going to write my own love songs to God. And the first song I recorded was Sing a Song of Love. Sing it loud and clear. And then I wrote, Lord, I give you my life. And I kept on writing. Kept on writing love songs to God. Songs like the one I just sang today. I'm forever yours. I keep your face before me. You're mine. And I am forever yours. I wrote, Lord, you are forever, forever in my heart. I wrote, I choose you again. And again, uh, I'll, and that song I wrote, I love you always. You know the song, always. And then I wrote, Lord, tell me again that you love me. And you love me till the stars fall from the skies. And then I wrote, Lord, I've never known a love like this before. My heart song is alive. My heart is alive with your love song. I wrote a, a lyric one day, the moment I whisper your name, my life is never the same. So you can call me a romantic if you want to, but I believe my deepest passion, intimacy, and my tenderest emotions and my tenderest feelings belong to God. And that's why I reserve my deepest passion and intimacy and my feelings for God. Now, this approach to loving God may not be how you deepen your passion and intimacy and feelings for God. This is how I do it, however. Loving God is my greatest romance. And this is what I mean when I say that. And I take it seriously. When Jesus says, don't lose that, son. That's first love. You know, I even wrote a book you can find it on Amazon. I wrote a book called My Love Notes to God. You see, through the years, I've written hundreds. You know how, you know how when you, you, you love your wife or your husband and you just write him a little love note and leave it hanging around? Over the years, I've just written love notes to my God. And I put them in a book. I was trying to tell God about the depth of love and feeling I have for him. And here are a few of those love notes I've written to God over the years. I'm going to run through them quickly. So listen quickly. Amen. At every dawn, I wait patiently for your arrival. Every morning, 
I saw into your waiting arms. Life has one great treasure, loving you, my God. When your soul is tempted, just love him more. Loving God is a glorious pursuit, engulfing enough to consume your entire lifetime. Your love raises me to a higher life. Number 26, Lord, place your loving arms around me, your needy child. I need your love to hold me, to carry me, to keep me. Lord, your love is always faithful and true. Another one, your love restores me. Your love dries my tears. Another one, your love knows only kindness and gentle ways. God, you who sees me through and through and knows me, loves me still. And then I wrote another one. Lord, may my love for you be constant and unwavering. I wrote this. This is the curse of life to never know the love of God living within the soul. My heart is so full of love for God, there is not room for much else. Loving God has made me feel so alive. And I wrote one day, come my love and stand with me. Jesus, lover of my soul. You know the hymn, let me to thy bosom fly. Lord, I love you with each breath I take. Each time I call your name, I fall in love again. You are my music, my melody, my song. When you're out of my life, nothing's the same. I wrote another one. There is no need in my heart that your love cannot meet. There is no need in my heart that your love cannot meet. If we spoke only once a day, I would be a poor and lonely man. I wrote that one. Number 218, until the earth crumbles into dust, your love for me will endure. I wrote about 500 of those love notes to God. Everything I am and everything I do is swallowed up in the contentment of knowing that you love me. When I, oh, I love this one. When I speak your name, I linger between shadow and dream. I want my heart to be a mirror where you can see yourself in me. When I bow my head and close my eyes, I feel like a blind woman waiting on the arrival of her lover. I can't see his face, but I can sense his presence and I can hear his voice. When I first met God, I knew I would be in love forever, I wrote. One day I wrote 234. Insight, I had about 500 of them. I can't read them all. Insight comes when I gaze into the light and love of your eyes. Oh, I love this one. As a raindrop glistens, tenuous and tender, my heart sits suspended, waiting to hear my lover's voice. I'm waiting to hear you, Lord. 236, sometimes when we dream together, I slumber. Uh, uh, let, me, let me back up and say this one slowly. Sometimes when we dream together, I slumber, and he stays awake and watches me. Your love for me is so earnest, so deep. When I know not what to say, I, I love this one. When I know not what to say, God places his fingers on my lips and cherishes my silence. And I don't know what to say. He places his fingers on my lips and cherishes my silence. I got about 500 of them. I can't read them all. But what I'm here to tell you is you can call me a romantic if you want to, but loving God is my greatest romance and it is my love for God that comes through in my singing and in my preaching and it has touched people in some of the most amazing ways. One day I was in, mm, I was in Grand Rapids, Michigan. I was attending a conference at a big corporate headquarters and they said to me, you know, there's a young man here in Grand Rapids who wants to meet you. I said, really? He said, please, yeah, I'd love to meet him. This young man came up to me and said, sir, he's a grown man now, 
well known around the world. He said, when, when I was eight years old, he said, my mother took me to one of your concerts. And as a little boy, I sat there and you sang a song that you said you had just written. A song, by the way, that I had never recorded and had forgotten. And this young man began to say, can I tell you what the words of the song was? Since eight years old, I've never forgotten it. He said, one of the lyrics in the song said, God, your love is brighter than the sun, sweeter than a thousand roses, and heaven hasn't yet begun. That young man was Marvin Sapp, the great gospel singer. He heard me sing that song of my love for God. Love, your love is brighter than the sun, sweeter than a thousand roses, and heaven hasn't yet begun. Brothers and sisters, if you feel like the romance has gone out of your relationship with God and your marriage, I've got a few spiritual tips for you before I leave. To put the romance back into your marriage, you must believe that with both of you, listen, 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 that, let me tell you today, loving God this way, loving God deeply, spiritually, even making loving God your greatest romance, Loving God this way is what will heal your marriage. And it's got to be reciprocal. It can't be one-sided. If both of you, if for both of you, loving God is your greatest romance, it will put the romance back in your marriage. You will learn to put your deep feelings into words and actions. And remember what I said, you will repent, you will what? Remember, and you will what? Recover that first love. You know the florist who says he loves flowers and forgets to water them doesn't really love flowers. The physician who says he loves his patients but forgets to give them medicine and bind up their hurts and wounds is not worthy of a physician's name and honor. A husband or a wife who says he loves or she loves her mate, but who does not freely give himself or herself in love and affection and can't find time to nourish the wife's heart with romantic words and actions is really not in love at all. So to keep first love and romance alive, don't forget, be attentive, nourish that relationship, Keep it fresh and alive. Years ago, a young woman in England, many years ago, she always wore around her neck a golden locket. A locket she would not allow anybody to open or to look into it. And everyone thought that there was some romantic connection with that locket and that locket must be the picture of the one that she loved, or maybe the one she lost. One day the young woman died. She died, died at an early age, and after her death, the locket was opened. Everyone was wondering whose face would be in that locket. Well, when they opened the locket, there was a little slip of paper and upon that paper were written these words, whom having not seen, I love. She was talking about Jesus. I've never seen him, but I love him. Whom having not seen, I love. Jesus was the lover she longed, the one she carried in that locket. Can I tell you this truth? There is nothing on earth that is sweeter than to be in love with somebody 
who for them loving God is their greatest romance. Nothing sweet in the world. And the more I think about that, it's probably why Jesus used marriage to reveal the kind of relationship he wants to have with us and his church. You know, the history opened with a wedding and it will close with a wedding. <laughs> My brother and my sister, is loving God your greatest romance? Will you pray with me? I can hear Jesus saying, repent, remember, recover that first love, the romance. I can hear Jesus saying, you remember how how you long to spend time together with me. You remember when we talked and prayed, you prayed for hours, you didn't want to stop talking, you didn't want to stop listening. Trust me, the best thing you can do for your marriage is to make loving God your greatest romance. And I'm not ashamed to tell you, my brothers and sisters, as your heads are bowed and eyes are closed, that falling in love with Jesus has been my life's greatest romance. And I encourage you today, keep your heart tender towards God. Let there be a revival of that first love in your heart. When the heart becomes tender, your thoughts, your service will become more Christ-like and the power of God is magnified when the heart is tender. And so today, I want you to invite God and invite Jesus into your life. Perhaps in a way you've never done before. That you will commune with him. You will sit alone with him. He'll talk to you. You'll talk to him. And you'll have a relationship of passion, passion, passion. Intimacy. Tenderness. May loving God be your greatest romance you know there's an old chorus oh how I love Jesus oh how I love Jesus oh I want us to sing it as we close oh, oh how I love Jesus oh oh how I Love Jesus, oh, how I love Jesus, because he first loved me. To me, he's so wonderful. To me, he is so to me he is so wonderful to me he is so wonderful 
Because he first loved me. Just hum it. Just hum it. that we would like to give to anyone here today who has lost a spouse. If you have lost a spouse, I don't know if they have the roses ready. I'm going to invite you to just raise your hand and someone will come to you with a rose today. There's a hand here, there's a hand there, there's a hand there. There's a hand in the back. My, my, my. Yes, thank you, Lord. My, 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 my. Quite a number of you have lost a spouse. My, my. Mm, there's another hand right in the middle here. There's a hand right in the middle over here. Praise the Lord. Yes. And if there are any couples here today, you want to ask God, Lord, just teach us more how to love each other and to love you so that that love will be our greatest romance. If you're sitting with your spouse or if you're, if you're here with your spouse, just one of you raise your hands. We want to, have, we want to make sure you get a rose today. Is that all right? All right. Just raise your hand. Someone's coming to you with a rose. That making loving God and loving each other our greatest romance. All right. Praise the Lord. Let the church say amen. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Yes. Hands all over. Thank you. Father, thank you for this wonderful Sabbath. Thank you for reminding us that loving God is our greatest romance. We pray in the name of Jesus. Amen and amen. will guard his children in his arms he carries them all day long praise him praise him tell of his excellent greatness praise him praise him ever in joyful song praise 
praise Him, praise Him, Jesus our blessed Redeemer. For our sins He suffered and bled and died. He our rock, our hope of eternal salvation. Hail Him, hail Him, Jesus the crucified. Sound His praises, Jesus who bore our sorrows, love unbounded, wonderful, deep and strong. Praise Him, praise Him, tell of His excellent greatness. Praise Him, praise Him, ever in joyful song. Our blessed Redeemer, heavenly waters, thou with hosannas ring. 